Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the February event of the Blick Society. Just before I hand over to my fellow trustee, Sibylla Earl, who will introduce the speaker tonight, Jason Whitaker, may I just thank you all for coming tonight. Over 300 people have registered, which is a record for the society and one of the miracles of Zoom. The Blake Society was founded in 1985. And I'm inviting you very briefly for you to join the society. In its short history, the society has championed the place of Blake in our culture. And as a member of the society, you have access to all our events. We publish a journal which will be sent out in printed form to our members. We've kept an eye on the two surviving homes of William Blake and Catherine. We've marked Blake's grave in Bunhill Fields. But most important, I invite you to join because for the very small fee we encourage you to pay, you're marking what is central to life today. Blake's centrality of the human imagination. So if you would like to join, please go to our website and there's a button there for joining. I'm now going to hand over to Sibylla. and Jason. Thank you. Um, I'm delighted to welcome my colleague, Jason Whitaker for what was going to be the launch of his Blake biography, Divine Images, The Life and Works of William Blake. The book, which will be published by Reaction, will be out on the 12th of April. It says the 15th of March on the website. I am sure that introducing Jason Whitaker is unnecessary. Many of you will be connected to Jason via Twitter. He has been writing on Blake for many years and needs no introduction. So please allow me to pay a personal tribute to the range and rigor of his scholarship on Blake. Two poems by Blake are mentioned in the blurb of Divine Images, the life and work of William Blake on the Reaction website. The blurb refers, refers to two very popular poems, The Tiger and Jerusalem. The Tiger gives me occasion to mention Jason's fine chapter on Blake in music, which he wrote for William Blake's reception in Europe, published by Bloomsbury in 2019. Jason Whitaker is a regular contributor to Blake and Illustrated Quarterly and the go-to person for all things Blake and music. Jerusalem gives me the pleasure to mention that Jason has another forthcoming book with Oxford University Press on Blake, the hymn Jerusalem, and Blake's controversial cultural afterlife and legacy. In his talk tonight, Jason will give us an illustrated and guided tour of his divine images and his choices and challenges he faced and met as a Blake biographer. He will speak for about 40 minutes and illuminate on his interest in Blake and his fascination with Blake's faith, beliefs and religions. The talk will be followed by a Q&A led by Jason. Thank you very much, Sibylla. And also thank you, Tim, for inviting me as well to speak this evening. Um, I just wanted to give one Minor correction, simply because I know Kerry Davis is in the audience. And if there's one person who's the go to um, figure in Blake studies on Blake and music, it is Kerry. Um, so, very, uh, th th there's a number of people I saw joining tonight. Very pleased to speak with you all. Um, what I 
proposed to do. And if you don't mind, while, while I'm speaking to begin with, I, I really want to open up an opportunity for questions and answers. But while I'm speaking, just because of background noise and stuff like that, I'll probably just mute everybody for the moment, um, just to simplicity. But then if you want to unmute yourselves to ask questions, etc., please, please feel free. Um, a couple of comments that I wanted to make. Uh, the, the talk tonight is based very much on this book that's going to be coming out in April. It was meant to be coming out. In fact, it was meant to be out by the, the beginning of 2021. But one of the joys of COVID means that various publishers and printers and things like that were, were furloughed during 2020. Um, so fingers crossed, uh, uh, it will be arriving in the UK. Physical copies will be arriving next week. And then the publisher reaction books wants a lead in time of about six weeks before they launch it fully so that you can actually get hold of a copy um, at the beginning of April. What I want to do tonight, however, is really talk about a personal response. This talk tonight is going to take two, two forms or two strands. One is a very much a personal reaction to Blake. This is a book which has taken me 30 years to write in the sense that um, I, I was speaking to some students earlier this evening about my interest in Blake, which began when I was 19 years old and I, I came across um, a copy of The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. And for reasons which will become quite clear, I think, as I talk, literally turned my own personal world upside down. The lights went on and they've never gone off in all that time. It's interesting, I've written on a various other writers, figures, activities, and after a while I get bored and move on to something else. William Blake is a figure who I never, ever get bored of. And actually, I'm already stacking up the future two, three, four projects that I want to begin work on Blake um, to, to explore different facets of his art and writing. So as well as some of these personal responses, which will come through in some of the images and texts that I've chosen to talk about tonight, I also want to track through something of, argument is too fanciful a word, but, but some of the reactions in Blake, sorry, my personal reactions, so responses of my, my own part to Blake's thinking, his art, his writing about religion in particular, um, and that, that itself, religion is a contentious word. But Blake's thoughts on the divine um, in their widest aspects. And that's one thing that, that actually writing this book, I deal very much with Blake's life, clearly. Uh, um, it's intended as much as anything as, as comprehensive as possible, a guide to his works. Um, and I mean, you know, beginning with the engravings he performed, the, the, the work he began as an apprentice to James Bezier um, in the, the 1770s, going through to those final unfinished manuscripts that he was working on, the, the, the illuminated sketches uh, for the book of Genesis, uh, for the book of Enoch, etc. I've tried in Divine Images to be as comprehensive to the quality and range of Blake's works as possible. Um, that's given a particular great pleasure for me. Um, for the first time, I've actually, I've been writing about Blake for a very, very long time. And not to impugn any of my publishers, publishers don't usually like printing a lot of <laughs> images, truth be told. And one of the things that attracted me to this particular project with Reaction was that they wanted a lavishly illustrated book. There's over a hundred illustrations to accompany the 90 odd thousand words that I've written. Um, and, and so it's given me a great opportunity to write about Blake's art in some detail, as well as his poetry. So forgive me for a moment, I just want to share screen. Um, what I'm going to do in terms then of the specifics of the, the examples, as it were, of the, the works that I want to look at, is really just to focus on five particular texts. Um, I, I can, and frequently do, talk about Blake for hour after hour after hour, but in the remaining 30 odd, 30 odd minutes that are left to me, I want to, to, to focus on five specific examples, which for me are incredibly illuminating ways of examining how Blake approaches the subject of the divine. 
The one that I'll begin with um, should be familiar to all of you, certainly the, the majority of you, and provided the title for this particular book, which is The Divine Image, Blake's Song of Innocence, which he first published in 1789. I won't read the whole poem out, but you know, so it begins famously to mercy, pity, peace, and love all pray in their distress, and to these virtues of delight return their thankfulness. And what I particularly want to end, I've, I've given there the um, quotation which ends this particular um, poem, this particular lyric. And all must love the human form in heathen Turk or Jew, where mercy, love, and pity dwell their God is dwelling too. And the reason for starting with this particular poem is that actually it is my own personal favourite of all of Blake's works. This is the, it, it, you know, if, if I had to have one poem um, inscribed on my tombstone, you know, this would be the poem. This for me, I, I've not lived up to it, but it's been an attempt to, to form, if, if I have a credo, it is this poem. And I want to begin by tracing through why this poem has been so profoundly affecting upon myself. So I first began studying Blake. Um, it was actually as an undergraduate course. So I, I, I was reading a degree in English literature. And in our second year, we had to do a, um, a module on romanticism, which, you know, at, at that point, Byron. Byron was my go-to man, followed by Coleridge. You know, the, the, I, I, I'd long been interested in the romantics, but um, for want of a better word, it was the flashier end of the romantic movement that, that interested me as a young man. And during that course, I say, I read The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. And, and one thing that become, I, I'm going to sort of drip feed, feed throughout this talk, are some of the personal reactions, why Blake has been so important to me as an individual. So at that start stage, I was still really going through a transition from having been a very, uh, come, come from a very profoundly religious family. I was raised, uh, the, the, the cliche is stri a strict Catholic family. That, that, that doesn't really explain it, but, but for various reasons, one of which I will come to at the end of this talk, um, religion and particularly Catholicism was incredibly important to me growing up, so much so that for a long period of time, I actually wanted to become a priest. You know, that, that, was kind of, that seemed to me the only vocation worth following. Uh, <laughs> for a whole host of reasons, which I will not go into this evening, that very quickly began to unravel when I went to university. I think you can probably imagine, you know, a, a young, good Catholic boy being let away from home. The world did not follow its preordained path. And so I was going through an incredibly profound spiritual crisis. I just didn't really understand it. I didn't know it at the time. And it was during this period that I first encountered Blake. And that, that, that encounter with the marriage of heaven and hell was particularly important because I, what I often summarize this for students, I begin by saying, you know, the marriage of heaven and hell, this short pamphlet, which Blake writes in 1790, is one of the most astonishing books ever written, in which Blake basically says, everything you know about everything is wrong. You know, I am on the side of the devils and everything you have ever been taught um, and the nature of God uh, should come instead from the devil's party. Now, that's, you know, for, for, for a young Catholic lad, that was a hammer blow which shattered apart my ways of thinking. And I've spent the past 30 years plus reconstructing myself, my ideas from those shards which scattered. But I kind of want to draw attention then to a more benign aspect of Blake to begin with, which is, for me, encapsulated by this poem, The Divine Image. And there's a couple of points, uh, one of which will be particularly important for this talk this evening. And, and indeed, throughout the book is something I try to draw attention to again and again. And that is that the divine image, this notion of well, uh, God, I, I use that. Blake uses that word, so I'll, I'll go with that for the moment. But this notion of God is something that very much stems not from a system of beliefs, not from a series of dogma. It stems instead from a particular practice. And one of the things that I would um, particularly draw attention to is that for a poet who wants to locate the divine in the human, the human form divine, 
there's a whole host of adjectives that you could choose, you know, powerful, um, wise, all seeing, omnipotent, omniscient, you know, typical words that have been used to describe the deity over the centuries, over the millennia. But Blake focuses upon mercy, pity, peace, and love. What it is to be divine for Blake is to exercise these particular virtues. And actually, one of the things that I'll start to move throughout this talk is actually just how profoundly important those virtues are to Blake, and in particular to his vision of Christ, his Christology, which is founded not, and, and this is why I think Blake is so important as a thinker, as a writer, as an artist, is that for him, the fundamentals of our, our relationships with each other are established upon these particular virtues. Now, throughout his poetry elsewhere, I, you know, at this moment, I'm reducing Blake to a series of quatrains, a series of incredibly simple verses that appear in Songs of Innocence. Um, and throughout his poetry, you, you know, you'll find Rintra full of rage. You'll find Orc, the spirit of rebellion. I'd even argue at certain points that Eurizen as the spirit of reason in his original unfallen form is a kind of, is a son of light, is, is actually a figure to, to, um, to be considered as virtuous before he attempts to overstep his boundaries. But actually, it's these very, very fundamental and incredibly simple um, ideals which Blake espouses as fundamental to our understanding of religion. Um, and also, you know, as somebody who's worked in higher education now for, for 20 odd years, uh, mercy, pity, peace, and love are virtues which will be practiced more often, I think, than by children, than academics. And this, again, is something that's fundamental to how Blake approaches his understanding of the self to the external world and also the divine world. So the divine image, I say, it's kind of a personal plea that this is, for me, one of the most perfect poems ever written. I mean, it, I, you know, I memorized it many, many years ago and I frequently recite it to myself. It's almost like a little daily prayer um, that I kind of tell myself to, to try and sustain me in those hours of darkness. But I actually want to move now to it, back to closer to the beginning of Blake's career. And actually for me, what is one of the most profound um, commentaries that Blake offered on the nature of divinity, on the nature of religion. And this is one of his first um, illuminated books, his first experiments in stereotype printing, um, produced in the 1780s and, and given the title, there's two of them together. I'm, I'm just gonna concentrate on all religions are one and his other companion title, There Is No Natural Religion. And I will just read um, the verses here. I don't know how many people have read these aphorisms. They're actually, while short, incredibly dense. And I, I could spend a very long time untangling these. I just want to draw attention to one or two features. Principle, first, that the poetic genius is the true man and that the body or outward form of man is derived from the poetic genius. Likewise, that the forms of all things are derived from their genius, which by the ancients was called an angel and spirit and demon. Second, as all men are alike in outward form, so and with the same infinite variety, all are alike in their poetic genius. Third, no man can think, write or speak from his heart, but he must intend truth. Thus, all sects of philosophy are from the poetic genius adapted to the weaknesses of every individual. Four, as none by traveling over known lands can find out the unknown, so from already acquired knowledge, man could not acquire more. Therefore, a, a universal poetic genius exists. Five, the religions of all nations are derived from each nation's different reception of the poetic genius, which is everywhere called the spirit of prophecy. Six, the Jewish and Christian testaments are an original derivation from the poetic genius. This is necessary from the confined nature of bodily sensation. So I said, this is actually incredibly dense text. And, and I'm going to spend, what, five minutes just entangling. And there's, there's actually, there's one very important point that I want to return to. And that is this notion of poetic genius. Before discussing that, however, 
I want to just draw attention to just how incredibly profound Blake was as a thinker about the nature of the divine, the nature of enlightenment philosophy in his earlier years. This is a text that, amongst other things, reacts incredibly strongly to the works of John Locke. And this, along with Newton, along with Francis Bacon, John Locke was one of the figures whom philosophically Blake set himself up most in opposition. And again, forgive me at this moment for simplifying, and I'll be very happy for discussion, correction, amendments, discourse later on. Um, but, I, but I'm going to simplify what for me at this moment in this talk is the most important point about this relationship to Locke. And that is that for Locke, the source of self, the source of our identity of who we became, who we become, is entirely external. You know, Locke famously described the, the, the mind of an infant, the mind of a newly born person as a tabula rasa, that blank slate upon which the external world leaves it its, its impressions. And thus our minds are formed by a reaction to these external events, these external impressions. Blake utterly, and I cannot emphasize this enough, utterly opposed that. The mind is not formed by a reaction to external sense impressions, but rather takes those sense impressions and through the poetic genius, which I think Northrop Fry was correct to give a simpler name, imagination, that what Blake insisted upon is that it is the act of imagination which shapes our sense of the world around us. Now, he was not some simple solipsist idealist. His argument was never that the mind simply creates the external world and, it, and you know, sort of like some of those later German idealists, that, 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 that the sense of self is everything and projects onto the world. No. For Blake, imagination takes sense impressions. He, he again and again draws important attention to the importance of the senses. But his epistemology, his sense of how we perceive the world around us, is fundamentally tied to the way in which the active drive of energy, of imagination, of desire reacts to those, those sense impressions that fall upon us. So Blake fundamentally turns Lockean epistemology, uh, a notion of empiricism on its head. And this is the second point with regard to religion that I really want to just focus on for a moment. Um, about 10 years ago, the religious philosopher Stephen Prothero uh, released actually a, a really significant book. It's not very long. I, I do recommend everybody, you know, if you're interested in subjects of theology of world religions, to read it. And the title is All Religions Are Not One. Um, and it starts off with a quotation, the, the opening of, of William Blake, all religions are one. And, and um, Prothero says, you know, in the 18th century, we find the beginning of this notion that all religions are the same, emerging with William Blake, who said that, you know, everybody believes the same thing. No, it's quite clear that Stephen Prothero, he's probably read all religions as one, but he's not really read past the title. And he certainly hasn't understood what Blake is saying. What Blake is saying is that all religions are one, it's because all religions are products of the imagination. All religions are made up. They are invented. What Blake is talking about here is the necessary spirit of invention that motivates us to find out, to create, to invent the world around us. As he mentioned, you know, as none by traveling over known lands can find out the unknown, so from already acquired knowledge, man could not inquire more. We have to invent. Knowledge is driven not simply by passively receiving information from the external world, but by actively going out to acquire that knowledge. Now, what I'd like to do, as I've mentioned it several times already, is to pick a third insightful moment, which for me is actually one of the most important texts that Blake ever wrote. I myself have written on it now about half a dozen times. And this is plate 11 from The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. And in this text, Blake gives um, an account of the origins of religion. He gives 
um, uh, I think in many respects, a more amenable approach to that rather abstract arguments that he presented in All Religions Are One. So I'll just read, I'll read the text first. And then what I want to do is actually go through a brief analysis and ex exposition of this particular plate of what it means and, and also actually why it's been so important to me. The ancient poets animated all sensible objects with gods or geniuses, calling them by the names and adorning them with the properties of woods, rivers, mountains, lakes, cities, nations, and whatever their enlarged and numerous senses could perceive. And particularly, they studied the genius of each city and country, placing it under its mental deity, till a system was formed, which some took advantage of and enslaved the vulgar by attempting to realize or abstract the mental deities from their objects. Thus began priesthood, choosing forms of worship from poetic tales. And at length, they pronounced that the gods had ordered such things. Thus men forgot that all deities reside in the human breast. Now for me, this, this plate is one of the most astonishing things, not simply that Blake wrote, but indeed for me, it kind of strips away a whole raft of kind of comparative religious studies. You know, this, this largely, in terms of his philosophical ideas, this largely self-educated man for me gets to the nub of religion far better than pretty much any theologian of his age. Um, and what we see here, I mean, when I first wrote about this text, I was, I was very, I was fascinated about how it very much operated within the intellectual context contexts and currents of Blake's day. I mean, I, I'd been introduced to Blake as a romantic. You know, I've been introduced to Blake as the person who attempted to overthrow Newton, the, the, the writer, the artist who wanted to turn the world of Locke and Bacon upside down, who was opposed to the, to the Enlightenment in every sense, that Eurism, your reason, was the, the big baddie of all of Blake's works. Now, in the 1990s, I mean, pretty much the time that I got into Blake um, and started studying him, there, there, was, there was a considerable movement amongst a number of Romanticism scholars to actually get Blake removed from that particular category. Um, I'm, I'm not going to mention names, but the, I've, I've been involved in a number of conversations with uh, people who teach, you know, academics who, who will teach, Blake, uh, teach the, the Romantic period. Um, on a regular basis and they go you know so if you if you you know if you study and you write about Wordsworth then clearly you're going to have a link into Coleridge um, and actually you know that second generation I'll just stick with the big five leave Blake to one size for the moment you know that that second generation of the big romantic figures Byron, Shelley, Keats etc are responding to that first generation so you you see immediately that when you study one author you will then have an understanding or an affinity to the ideas of another from that period <laughs> and, then, and, and some very respected romantics that, and then they come to Blake and go who the hell what the hell is Bola Hula you know Golganuza what's that you have to literally learn this new vocabulary the other romantics yes they may experiment they may push the boundaries of of classical and indeed world mythologies, but they don't make it up from scratch, which Blake, of course, with his, his Zoas and his whole series of spectres and emanations, etc., creates a system from scratch. So Blake's whole poetic and artistic practice is an attempt to put into motion what he describes here in the marriage of heaven and hell, that for Blake, religion and, and, and that's a dangerous word to use, actually, at this juncture, because there's a very strong argument that, you know, Blake, the author, the poet of The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, is against religion, at least at this point. But forgive me, I, I kind of, I, I tend to avoid words like spiritual, spirituality, etc., in my own writing as, as being a bit woolly, if I'm honest. Um, but so Blake's approach to the divine is very much based upon the notion that the divine religion, our spiritual lives, is an act of imagination. We make stuff up. We invent 
gods. We invent systems of understanding the world around us. And what he does here, and this is very much in line, for example, you know, David Hume, the philosopher, um, in his account of natural religion, the, the development of religion, which um, goes back to, uh, you know, uh, La Vita Nuova, uh, La Scienza Nuova, the, the, the new science of Vico in the late 17th century. These Enlightenment thinkers were very much relating kind of um, religion to human activity. And their principal concern was effectively to undermine religion, to, to demolish it, to show that it was just one human activity amongst many. Blake himself, I mean, you know, that, that um, if, if we stick with the word that Blake uses, priesthood, Blake is very much part of that agenda. Blake wants to demolish the power structures that come out of conventional religion. But what Blake wants to replace religion with is not reason is not the project of the enlightenment as carried through by figures such as Hume. He wants to replace it with poetry. He wants to replace it with poesis, with making, with invention, with what for Blake is the fundamental activity that makes us human. For Blake, art is fundamental to what we do. Without art, we are not human. If we are not human, we cannot be divine because we cannot invent the world of the divine. Everything for Blake is supernatural because it is our act of invention, our act of making, our acts of poetry that invent nature, the supernatural. There's no dichotomy for these terms. It's only when we try to restrict our perceptions, we no longer operate with these enlarged and numerous senses that will decide. I mean, a, a, a very good example of this for me is, I think it's recorded by Crab Robinson, the conversation where um, he says, you know, somebody asks him that when he goes out and looks at the sun, does he see, you know, a gold disc about the size of a guinea? And says, no, no, I see a host of angels rising up and singing, you know, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I can't remember the exact quote. But, you know, Blake sees the same object that any other man, woman or child sees in the street. But when he sees it, he sees a host of angels. And another day he might see, I don't know, you know, urizen carrying it as a, a torch, or he might see it lost, lifting it out of the darkness. Every day, Blake can invent the world of objects around him because he is an artist. He is a poet. T. Hume, um, in his essay on classicism and romanticism, referred to romanticism as spilled religion as kind of what's left when the, 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 the impulse that we all have to pursue, pursue something larger than ourselves gets removed from religion. It says it kind of falls into this, this weaker form of aesthetics. Blake actually splits, turns that around completely. Religion, what we, you know, priesthood, what we understand by conventional religion is spilled poetry. It's the moment when we forget that we can recreate the world of the divine again and again and again. And, and for Blake, this is something that children do naturally. You know, they go out into the woods or the world around them. They play games. They simply perceive the world through these enlarged senses. What I want to do now is actually, rather than talking about religion in these very general terms, I now want to return to Blake's kind of, his, his understanding of Christ, of Jesus in particular. And, and what for me are two incredibly astonishing examples of just how willing Blake is to rewrite the Bible. You know, I, I still, after 30 years of this, I still cannot get over just how radical and how daring Blake is when it comes to reading the Bible. I know of no other author who is a Christian, who is a true believer, who is also willing to invent, to demonstrate his, his approach to this relationship to the divine. And I want to give two examples, and for me, two really profound examples. So the first is taken from um, Blake's illustrations to um, the book of Job. Actually, sorry, it's not as large. I, should, I really should have enlarged this picture. Um, uh, you, my, my, my temptation to be clever and give two versions, the painted version um, for Thomas Butts and then the final engraved version that appears in 
um, the edition he does for Linnell in the 1820s. It's actually the edition from Linnell I want to concentrate on, because I must be honest, I find, I find the Butts one slightly creepy. I'll return to that in a moment. Um, but the, the Linnell version, the, 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 the famous hand engraved versions, actually takes um, a single line uh, from the Book of Job. I've heard with the hearing of the ear, but now my eye may, my eye seeth thee. Blake takes this single line, and th this appears um, towards the end of the book of Job, after that famous speech in which Jehovah, God, appears out of the cloud, out of the hurricane, and tells Job, you know, canst thou draw up Leviathan? Canst thou draw him up with a hook? Basically, you know, I am God. I can make everything. You know, I, I, I'm all powerful. In the Linnell version, the, the, the text that surrounds, so, so the writing that surrounds that central, beautiful, incredibly delicately um, crafted illustration, um, it's largely drawn from the Gospel of John. It's talking, it, it's very much establishing, you know, Christ as the incarnation of the Father. But for me, this is actually where an example of where Blake's Christology is incredibly profound. The book of Job, amongst, you know, sort of the Edomites who originally composed this story, did not include any reference whatsoever to Jesus Christ, to, you know, the coming of the Messiah of an incarnation of God in human form. This is entirely, this is entirely Blake's invention. And for me, it's a, fa it's a momentary fascinating insight into some of the processes by which Blake works. Now, now one of the arguments, and which I could trace through in much greater detail, is Blake is engaging in a, in a long established, you know, a millennia long tradition of typology. You know, of looking into the Old Testament for precursors of the New Testament, examples where, you know, in the prophets, in the histories, etc., whereby, you know, um, Christian theologians and writers would draw attention and say this is a precursor of Christ's testimony. <laughs> I think that line, you know, my ears have heard thee, but now my eyes seeth thee, is really stretching the typology arguments. Blake is looking for an an important connection. And, and what Blake illustrates at this point, this is the turning point for Job. This is the moment at which Job realizes that his own understanding of religion has been flawed and, and that of his friends has been deeply flawed. Job has a moment of recognizing that it is he who creates God, that the incarnation of God is important. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. <laughs> Jason, we, we can't hear you. Can't hear you at all, I'm afraid. I can't hear you. No. No. <laughs> can you try logging off and logging back on? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, indeed. Right. Okay. I've just found, sorry, multiple microphones and the battery just ran out on one. That was good timing. Mm. Right. I'll finish this one then quickly. Um, it's a blink. <laughs> so what the point I was just making is that with regard to Blake's Christology um, in Job, 
This is the moment at which Job recognises that he is inventing the figure of God that has been punishing him. And this section, I'll, I'll, I'll end then in, and open up to questions. My apologies for the microphone. Uh, the joys of little label microphones. Um, I just then want to talk about this final image of Abraham, Abraham and Isaac. And hopefully people can still hear me. What I'll just draw attention to in this particular image is the posture of both Abraham and Isaac. Of course, according to the story, the very well-known story, Abraham is ordered, you know, instructed by God to take his son and offer him in sacrifice. When he comes to the mountaintop and he constructs the altar, so at the last moment, God intervenes and tells him, no, no, you know, you you don't need to kill your son. And Abraham at that moment sees a ram, which he sacrifices instead. I mean, historically, it's possible that this deals with, you know, ancient Semitic traditions, whereby the Hebrews move from forms of human sacrifice to a substitute um, with animal sacrifice. The important point, and this is just another, a final example of how Blake rewrites the Bible or re-illustrates the Bible. I'll just draw attention here. The posture of Abraham, Abraham standing at the altar, the knife in his hand, looking up to heaven, is his eyes open, but unseeing. He's completely trapped in his own mental world. The terrifying thing about this picture is that there's no God telling Abraham to do it. The God that instructed Abraham to kill his son is actually entirely his own invention it's this this spectral voice which has instructed him that proper religion is the sacrifice of others and also in this image it is not Abraham who sees the ram but his son Isaac in other words Abraham the druidic sacrificial cultish figure is still willing to kill his son. It's the naked Christ-like son who says, there is an alternative way. Religion does not need to proceed through the sacrifice of humans and of children. So this is an incredibly important example of how Blake, by placing religion in the human, by making us, us responsible for our own knowledge of the divine, we are the ones who shape the supernatural world. We are the ones who create those images. And that, for me, is why Blake still remains one of the most important prophets. Thank you very much. And my apologies for the glitch of the microphone. Ow. So I'll open now for any questions. And also, I guess, just to say, Divine Images, The Life and Works of William Blake will be available from the 12th of April from all good booksellers, assuming we can all go into booksellers at that point, other than just Amazon. So thank you very much. And mm. I shall stop sharing the screen and open up for any questions or comments. Hi, Jason. Hello, I can hear a voice, but I can't, actually I'll go into gallery view, so hopefully I can- It's just happy. Hello, <laughs> hello. <laughs> Um, I'm so excited to hear about this book. I've been really, really looking forward to it and um, found that so interesting. I've actually been um, kind of spending some time with the French Revolution doing um, revolutionary French thinkers in relation to Beethoven in a class that I'm teaching. And so like, it's really cool to suddenly like have everything tied together in one evening. It's very exciting. <laughs> but um, I can't wait for the book. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I say this, this it's, funny, it's taken me 30 years to write this book and then 30 years time I want to write it completely differently because my relationship to Blake is always changing in that way. But yeah, of course. thank you. Uh, could I make a comment? And yes, please. A question at the same time. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, I'm working on my PhD dissertation right now and I'm planning to in incorporate these images as well. And yes. this helped me a lot uh, and I, I will, probably try to buy your book. <laughs> it will be difficult to buy it in Turkey, but uh, the last image you showed, Abraham looking upwards and thinking yes. in his mind, uh, that brought to my mind the idea of bicameral mind, bicameralism. Uh, yes. 
I, have, I haven't come up with any studies that compares Blake with bicameralism, but do you know any studies like that? No, uh, 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 not, not necessarily explicitly in, that, in, in, in such bold terms, no. I, I know what you mean. Uh, that there's, oh God, sorry, I don't have it immediately to hand. That, that probably some more interesting stuff, and I think it's through Robert Essek actually, um, would be, he actually started with concentration on Blake's relationship to Mon. Actually, that goes back to Northrop Fry. The relationship of Blake to Monism as a rejection of some of the bicameralism in, in particular. Um, one thing I, I, is a project I, I'd started and abandoned because, to be honest, I wasn't smart enough to do it. I was attempting to do something several years ago, God, two decades ago now, trying to actually approach the issue of that kind of monistic view through Deleuze's work on Leibniz and the fold and actually of a way of moving through different material realities which ultimately share I mean ultimately although he's using Leibniz it went back to Spinoza and, and I went through a phase where I was trying to unite Blake and Spinoza but this kind of ultimate monism absolute nonsense I should never have tried I think Blake Blake actually is ultimately concerned with contra contrarieties and thus and thus would fit with some of those aspects of bicameralism. Um, so I think there's still work to be done there, is, is my simple get out of jail free at this, <laughs> this card at this moment. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's been work that goes back to Fry and several other thinkers since then that deal with kind of Blake's Engagement with contraries um, and his attempt to move to a kind of dynamic monism as well, which which would be on the edge of some of those studies as well. That, that those ideas that you're thinking of. Thank you. It'll be I very think... interesting seeing what work you're going to come up, come out with this. I'll do more research into bicameralism and yeah. like in order yes. to come up with something if I can. Yes, no, I'll be very interested in seeing that. Hello. Hello. Hi, hi, thank you for your talk. Thank you. Um, I'm interested in, um, I'm on a Facebook group that appreciates Blake and we have a lot of chats, fellow appreciators and, and I, I am a poet and an artist as well. And I'm interested in studying Blake's understanding of the Trinity. And this is such a huge topic. And I say, as a Christian as well, this is really hard even for Christians to understand the Trinity, yeah. unless I'm mistaken and somebody's got the magic key to that, but it's really hard. And I, I'm studying it, it's, it's a bit of a minefield really, but and it may be too big for the end of this, this discussion, but what is your understanding of Blake's understanding of the Trinity, God the Father? <laughs> well, I, I, I'll share that the, 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 the explanation for the Trinity, you know, being raised a good Irish Catholic uh, was always the shamrock. So, you know, three leaves, but one, pl one flower. Yeah, so, so, so the Trinity, but, you know, conceptually difficult? No, it's just like the shamrock. It's just um, then, obviously, that finds that. No, 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 no. no that, that, that was also that, that was just a, a glib priest. But it's a big, up. it's a big topic, and it's knowing that because because Blake did believe in Jesus, and he, he did, he was not a conventional Christian. One can say he was very critical of the churches, which is you know, which is fine by me. You know, he's a rebel, but he did believe, and he said that you know the Lord had a, a place for him with you know many mansions when he died. No, I, I so, so, so actually it's a really important question there, so, and, and picking up that notion that he did believe, absolutely. So I went through um, one of the drafts very explicitly, because I, I focus a lot in the book on this notion that you know all deities reside in the human breast. Blake repeats this again and again and again. Um, and, and it's, it, it's, it, it's a really simple temptation to fall into the notion and a wrong temptation that Blake is some kind of precursor to Nietzsche. There's some kind of atheist thinker. Or He's atheism. not. Yeah, absolutely. No, he, and actually, I had to go through make, trying to make sure there was removing references to atheism. The word, which doesn't exist, I know, but, but the people who try to, to introduce it, the really important word for me is, <laughs> and I can't even bring myself to say, a deist. He's an anti-deist. And particularly with deism, the notion that there is a God out there. And this is, this is actually, and, and I thank, I know it's in the audience, Kerry. Kerry Davis was the first person who put me onto this about 2007. It was the conference, the Blake conference we were at together. And you mentioned that, Kerry, that 
Blake wasn't so much concerned with Newton's physics as with his religion. And indeed, I went back to, you know, the, the Principia Mathematica, and there's a section on the Pantocrata, which is monstrous. It is absolute. It's basically your know, God is this immortal power who flicks the universe into motion and then buggers off and doesn't care. You know, God basically is a kind of sadist. He kicks the universe into motion and it's the perfect world because God made it. And people suffer. Oh, well. You know, it's all part of God's plan. And Blake has no time for this whatsoever. And the comment, because I just see there are other hands raised as well. The comment I would make is, is I'm not answering your question on the Trinity, forgive me, because I think no, that sorry, is a No, sorry, don't worry. And it's a big, a big, it's something I've got to research. It's big, but, it's a big topic. But something that's really important to me, and it's been really important to me now for 20 odd years, is that Blake is, what Blake has huge issue with is the God of this world, which he identifies with deism. Um, and I'll end, the comment I'll end with it is really interesting. And this is I have a massive problem with the guy. Um, Richard Dawkins, you know, famous atheist and all the rest of it, um, in, a, in an interview several years ago, kind of admitted that, well, if there was a religion that could appeal to him, it's deism, because it fits with his rational view of the universe. You know, maybe there is a first creator. Maybe there's something that kicks the universe into motion. I'm going, you have missed the point. It's a completely anti-Blakean view. Because for Blake, uh, the Trinity is fine because, you know, if you're a Hindu and you want a, a pantheon of deities, that's fine as well. That's the poetic genius. That's part of the human imagination. So for Blake, it is the act of creation. It's the act of perceiving the divine in everything around us. That's what religion is, not some... You know, not, not God flicking a domino that then cascades through the kind of cosmological arguments for, for, for origins. Um, so, so I haven't, forgive me, I haven't asked you a question. I could go on for a very long it's, time, it's, but I just see this other. I just, I think what you touched on was really interesting, though, was that he did, rebel that he was, and I love the rebel in Blake, I'm totally drawn to that. And I'm totally someone who will question everything. So that's fine by me. But he did believe, but not in the way Completely. that people I believe, but and maybe even people believe today. I'll, I'll also give it a very, very short, it's a very short line. And, and actually, I gave a talk on it two years ago now. And it blew, it, when I returned to it, because I'd written about it in my PhD, but not looked at it for 20 odd years. In Byron's Cain, Blake writes The Ghost of Abel at the end of his life, and he gives an incredible line, and it's a very short line, in which Satan appears in front of Je Jehovah, in front of God, and says, Jehovah, thou human. And for Satan, that is the ultimate insult. God is human. Blake is actually, in some respects, if I say anything, he's almost like an anti-Aryan. God doesn't elect man. Man creates God, and that is a divine act. I can see hands wave. There's a couple of hands waves. So I'll just go through in order. So I'll see Charles, Gareth, and Suzanne. And then other people will ask after. So, so Charles, if we can go to you first, because you, I think, just in the order that I've seen. Very, 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 very quickly, um, for your last speaker, there's the, a guy called Richard Rowe, who is a um, Francescan priest and talks about non dualism that you might well look at. The other thing I was interested in was that uh, the two sort of one, years and years ago Taoism which has some comparison to what you were saying and yeah. the other thing that that uh, was interesting is that there is some connection to CBT I know it's very mundane CBT and it's very surface stuff but there is an element of connection with that as well I don't know what you think about that the one I'll respond to is actually the Taoism one because I mean I am personally really interested in that but actually the one where there's been a lot of work done is with Zen and in Japan, Blake is immense. Blake, like 80s pop bands, is big in Japan. And one of the reasons for that is because... Um, Blake uh, is big in Japan. <laughs> yes, I that may repeat my words or somebody else. So um, one of the reasons for that is... Uh, oh, God. Oh, sorry, name, name's flipped. So, so in the 1920s, the translation of Blake into Japanese was because um, Soetsu Yanagi, the, the, invent, the, the, the founder of uh, the Minge, sort of arts and crafts, Japanese arts and crafts movement. When he looked at Blake's work, he saw Zen, he saw Buddhism, he saw that kind of, you know, that, 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 that anti-dualist thinking that took place there. Um, CBT, I don't know enough about to, to be able to properly comment on that. But well, certainly Taoism, I completely get that link. It, it's More just work's been done on Zen. It's that principle which, yeah. uh, it's not the event, it's what you make of the event. Exactly. Yes, yes. It's that perception. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 
Uh, I think it's Gareth next, and then Suzanne, and then Nicole's put a hand up as well. So Gareth. And hello, um, good to see you. Uh, good to see you too, Jason. And thank you so much. I, I, you know, what a wonderful, wonderful address you gave. Um, uh, following neatly on from that last point, actually, I, I wonder if you could give us uh, any of your thoughts on what Blake might have made of Kant, because on the one side, Kant seems to be in agreement with him. You know, we there is an objective world, but the way we understand it is centred within us. But then I I think of, you know, Kant has this strong idea of a moral law and everything. And I, and I I'm, remember Blake saying that, you know, there is no moral law, but maybe I'm just not understanding that. Do you have any thoughts on um, Blake and Kant? I, I think that there's a number of... I'll, I'll, I'll make my comments with, with a couple of provisos and one that I have very much become I've become very much aware of my own deficiencies reading Kant I read Kant and really struggle to understand it so I'm just going to say that immediately I'm not going to lie about that um I think there's a number of points whereby Kant and Blake are fairly close in agreement um so your comments in terms of how per, our perception of the, there is an objective world absolutely Blake never denies the objective world it's really interesting how much Blake goes on about, about objects in his poetry, you know, he's not an idealist in that, you know, Victor or Schelling or people like that later on, he's not an idealist. Um, but by the same token, our perception completely transforms, you know, the, our, our relation with that material world. Another point where he has a really strong connection with, or a stronger connection with um, Kant is through his notion of the sublime. You know, the, 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 the understanding of the sublime that came through Edmund Burke is that the, the, the sublime is obscure, it's dark, it's dangerous, it's, it's inchoate in some shape or form. And for Blake, no, the sublime is that crystal clear moment when you go, that's what it is. It's literally the light bulb kind of moment is the sublime act for Blake. And I think he shares that with Kant as well. Um, I think oh, you've touched, however, on the... Uh, now, first of all, there's no evidence at all that Blake knew Kant. There's just no evidence whatsoever. Um, I, I probably, you know, I, I'd be very willing to listen to somebody like Peter Otto, who's done a lot of work on Blake and Kant, who could correct me in a number of areas. Uh, you know, but unlike Coleridge, etc., you know, th there's no evidence that Blake, unlike Locke, or indeed even Berkeley, that Blake's made a serious study of Kant. Um, and where I think it, it's hard to align the two of them is precisely what you, what you hinged upon, that notion of a, the moral law, of this kind of moral certitude. I actually do think that for all Blake's attack on the moral law, Blake has an incredibly strong moral prerogative, but, and this is the important thing, it's that second word, it's law. I think where Kant fits into a conventional understanding that surrounds a lot of thinkers of the time is that morality ultimately comes externally. It's something that comes from outside of yourself. And Blake, just as with religion, just as with poetry, morality has to come from something internally. And there's that quote, I, I mentioned it earlier this evening from um, All Religions Are One. If you act on your honest emotion, you are seeking the truth. Now, there's real problems, you know, sort of in the, in the post-fact world that we live in, there are real problems, you know, but applying that is really problematic. But, but I think that's a fundamental to what Blake is trying to do, that he is attempting to fa find that, that found, a foundation of knowledge which comes from desire, imagination, from internal impulses rather than external um, agency. We could go on this for a long time, but I just know there's a. I think Suzanne, you had your hand raised, then there's Nicole, Peter, and David. So, yeah, Suzanne. This was wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It is so wonderful to get a treat like this during COVID. I was really intrigued by what Emma was asking about the Trinity, because I had to wrestle with that too. And I think one of the ways in which William Blake is so splendidly heterodox is that he has a quaternity. <laughs> yes. The fourfold vision is the human divine. The human yeah. is divine. And you know, I read about Jerusalem, the emanation of the giant Albion. And there I have scratched my head and wondered if Jerusalem, who is the bride of the lamb, is the spirit and the bride in Revelation 22, which would make her kind of sort of like the Holy Spirit and like a spirit yeah. emanates, 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 and yeah. it's all about emanation. 
But in the end, we're meant to partake in divinity. And, and, and um, is it Los who sometimes one says, God is within and without. He is even in the depths of hell. So yeah. God is within and God is infinitely bigger than all of us put together. But all of us put together are participating God, even tree, metal, earth, and stone. Yes. It's a form like panentheism is what that would be called. And I'm oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah. I was going to say, and, and the, give the, the alternative of that, which for me, when I, because I mean, one of the pleasures of writing this book was I, I had to reread everything that Blake produced. And I realized something I've, so, I hadn't touched some of these texts really since I was doing my PhD. It's kind of like, wow, this is so good. You know, that, it was, that was my treat to myself. But the one which really struck me again, and I write some a little bit of detail in the book, is that, that, that final, those final episodes from Milton, a poem, where Satan reveals himself. And, 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 and Blake, so is lost at the end, is sort of stand, he, he enters into Satan, and he kind of just realized that this is a ruined man. And that's Satan's problem is Satan cannot realize anymore that he is a man. Jehovah, thou human. So, so being human, not being God, not being divine in the way that we normally think about it, is the ultimate curse for Satan. And that stops him being God. You know, if he was like a little child just playing and inventing stuff, he would no longer be a ruined man. He would no longer be Satan. Um, pan pan I, I know exactly. I've, I've gone so much around the pantheism, panentheism, all stuff like that, particularly, you know, I, I, I first got into this with Coleridge. Um, so many things that Blake attacks, particularly Wordsworth for, make that a really difficult phrase. But I know exactly what you mean. I, I struggle to begin with to try and align that kind. I, I went through a phase where I was trying to align Spinoza and Blake, and in the end, I just I don't think they fit. They don't seem to match somehow. But that's that's another conversation, if you don't mind. I just see people yeah. coming this, in with questions. Like in yeah. innocence, when I a child and thou a lamb, we are called in His name. Yeah. There's something yeah. going on there about not just the human and the divine, but the human, the natural, and the divine. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm slightly losing track. Um, uh, to remember now. <laughs> so, uh, Nicole, so you, you've been waiting very patiently. Hi. Um, when Milton rewrote the Bible or parts of it in Paradise Lost, he was seen to be idolizing the devil, and they called him like of the devil or something. Obviously, when Milton did it, he did it with different goals. Did people react in the same way? Do you think? Did people react to Milton in the same way as they reacted to Blake? Do you mean or? Yeah, because I mean, uh, when Milton did it, it was kind of, you know, borderline blasphemy sort of way. <laughs> well, I think one of the things that with, with, with Milton, to, I mean, we've got to remember back in, you know, the 1660s when Milton publishes Paradise Lost. At that moment, you know, Cromwell, the, the Republicans, they've lost. So actually to a lot of people, Milton is... Milton is the ultimate heretic. Milton is politically outcast. I mean, you know, there, there's that brief period um, with the restoration of Charles II where I can't, I'm, oh, it's been a while since I've done work on this, but, you know, Milton's name is on lists. You know, Milton is very much persona non grata at that point. So I think people reacted very, very violently in the 1660s to Milton because he was on the wrong side. You know, he was on the losing side. He was no longer politically um, welcome in Britain. Then certainly uh, uh, what, what you then get, however, over the next 10, 20 years is, that, is actually diminishing of that political side of Milton. So, you know, by the time we get to the 18th century, it's Milton the poet, Milton the great architect of the English language. So by the time that Blake is writing about him, he's been... Depoliticized is the wrong word. He's still political, but he's been he's been defanged. He's not as toxic as he was to the vast majority of certainly royalists and supporters of the crown in the 1660s. So one of the things that I think that, that Blake does, as indeed other romantics, people like Shelley does, is that they, they in some respects, they kind of retoxify Milton. They and I'm using the word very carefully, the toxins, the intoxication, the poison that gets into the blood. Blake is one of the figures who wants to reintroduce this into its study of Milton. That, you know, it always amazes me, actually, when reading kind of or hearing people talk about prophets, that people pre presume that prophets are good people. 
that people presume that when a prophet speaks, everybody's really happy. Oh, look, there's a prophet speaking. Usually what happens is people go, shut the fucker up now. We do not want to hear what he has to say. So actually, usually, you know, you look at the Old Testament, when Jeremiah, Ezekiel, when all these people are speaking, the Hebrews do not want to hear. They do not want to listen to this. So actually, Milton, when he is a proper prophet like Blake, is actually is a pain in the backside. And that's what Blake recognizes in Milton. I think, you know, Milton is a worthy opponent for Blake because Milton is the toxin in the blood. He's, he's, he's the intoxication that makes you realize that this stuff matters. I haven't quite, forgive me, I haven't simply answered your question because I've got into a bit of a spiel there, but yeah. Um, I think for, for a lot of 18th century writers, that they, they had de, detoxified um, Milton. And, and that's one thing that, particularly in Marriage of Heaven and Hell, that's the starting process where Mil Blake goes, you know what, actually, what Milton's writing is really important. I don't agree with him, but it's actually really important for a whole host of reasons. I forget, I'm just going to go across the names at the top as I see the screen. So, David, next. Hi, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, can hear you. Thank you very much, because you have let me tie together a whole bunch of things that have been rattling around in my head for a while. Like yourself, I was raised as a fairly conventional and rather strict Catholic, and I didn't like it, or being gay didn't help. Yeah. Um, but I was puzzled because I could see there was something deep within Catholicism and other religions that I, I, I couldn't name. I, I, it's there, it's very important. I had no idea what it was, but it had, obviously it has local cultural manifestations. And it occurred to me that this, another aspect of being human, deeply human, was language which had exactly the same pattern. Yes. It's very deep, nobody really understands it, it has local manifestations. What you did this evening was to let me um, tie those together to the notion of imagination, which yeah. is very, very deeply involved in both. But what also follows from, from that thought is that um, there can be, just as there can be no true, no true language, it's a, it's, it's a silly idea to have a one true language. Yes. Equally, it's silly to have a one true religion claim because it bubbles up within us and we can't deny what others uh, create in, in themselves without denying what we create in ourselves. Uh, my my yeah. response, my, uh, one response I says that is, is just to return to that notion that, that if there is one true religion, it's, the, it's imagination, it's invention. Yeah. It's actually, it's, it's, that, it's that willingness. I say that, um, I love Suzanne's, you know, that, that it's not the Trinity, it's the quadrinity. But also the same token, if, you know, if you'd been a Hindu, it would be a pantheon, a whole panoply of deities, and all would be correct, as indeed would it be a Unitarian, as long as it was based on pity, mercy, pity, peace and love. Yeah. Yeah, you don't have but, an exclusion. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I forget, we're going to bring a few other people waiting patient. So, so Anise, I'm just going to the name at the top, so Anise. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Anise. Um, yes. Hello, Jason. Hello. Um, I was just wondering, um, when I was um, looking at the picture of Abraham and Isaac, what you thought about connecting it with the penultimate plate of Jerusalem with God, where the God is drawn looking yes. very much like yes. Abraham there. Yes. Um, and where I've, Abraham is almost a representation of like the I've earthly struggled God. for 30 years with that picture from Jerusalem. Um, that Blake ends his vision of the divine revelation with what looks like a druid is deeply, deeply disturbing to me. Um, do you, I, I can't answer that one simply. I just cannot answer that question simply. So do you mind if I pick that up with you another time? Just because yeah, I know no that you, I, I, it's a really good question. And I've struggled for 30 years with that bloody image. So I can't answer, I'll, get, uh, I'll, I'll return and ease that one. Uh, Peter. So again, you've been waiting very patiently. Thank you for your enthusiasm, Jason. Um, a couple of, uh, three points. Uh, firstly, uh, the question of the Trinity has arisen, uh, which is dealt with by Blake in uh, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, when he speaks without, um, without contraries, there, in, there is no progression. He suggests attraction and repulsion, love and hate as necessary to human progress. And in this incredibly saucy um, book, pamphlet of his, um, 33 years is mentioned, which was uh, 
uh, 33 years after his birth, the new religion uh, suddenly come into being. Um, and the word religion itself is, uh, a, for me, a red rag to my bull, in as much as the etymological root of religion, I'm sure you're more familiar than I am with it, is to bind again, yes. tie yes. again, to yes. retie. To retie to what? To retie to what? To retie to the lies of the priests and the inventions of the priesthood? Certainly not. Blake gets my vote every time because he's a man, for me, who sees the world upside down. He is a prophet. And as he, as he said later, he's certainly without a lot of honor in his own yeah. country. And hopefully things are changing. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, for, as I, I, I use the word religion. I use the word religion as much as anything because I don't like to use the word spirituality because I think that's that that it's a very much debased coin for me over the past few decades. The, the, the term I use regularly when talking about Blake's approach to religion, because it is a bad word, is, is simply the divine. Uh, Blake has this notion of something that is greater than the sum of the parts, which I think is a fundamental approach of religion about the but yeah and that's what he, he's constantly engaging with um but yes uh, uh, and that's why very often when speaking about more traditional approach to religion he provides the word priestcraft priestcraft is what he's very much opposed to um stephen again sorry again i'm just noticing that people have been waiting so if you'd like to come in oh hi there thank you ever so much jason that was a really fascinating talk just to um sort of tie together the trinity and milton he's uh, Blake says in The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, his criticism of Milton is that for him, the father is destiny, the son, a ratio of the five senses and the Holy Ghost vacuum. vacuum. Yes. So, <laughs> he sums up all the limitations of that idea of God. And um, also in the, in the actual poem, Milton, it seems to me that what Blake finds is missing in Milton with his patriarchal views is the female. And yes. Isn't it true that for Blake, the divinity is, is absolutely essential if we're to be truly human, to have a complete uh, relation of those countries? Of it is. And also, actually, it's something that over the years I've become quite critical of Blake as well, because I think he re recognises that. Mm. But he can't do the necessary step to fully rec to recognise it. For me, for example, it, it, he'd, have, he'd have sorted a load of these problems or these issues for me if he'd have made a couple of the Zoas female. Mm. But his inability to get beyond Zoas are male and emanations are female, he just really struggles with that fundamental. And, and it, you know, he probably needed another century to, to get through it or something, but yeah. Because I think he was on the track, he was definitely on the path. But for me, he, his rewriting of Milton, you know, his, his, his rewriting of Milton amongst other things recognizes that Milton has completely excluded the, the female. You know that that Milton needs to find Olalon again, but Blake hasn't managed yet to in incorporate it. And that, for, and particularly in his later works, there's all that really problematic stuff about the female will. You know that Blake himself is engaged in this quite complex struggle. That there's always a danger of reading Blake into what his characters say in his poems. But the fact that, that a lot of this comes from loss is really problematic actually if it comes from eurism oh yeah that's just eurism but the fact that blake does clearly use losses as his, his his counterpart in you know a, a projection makes some of his stuff about the female world really problematic i think he was struggling with it he, he realized there was a problem i think it's helen bruder helen bruder says that you know the reason why blake is so important to studies of gender is not because he gets it right but because he recognizes it's important in a way that, you know, Byron and Shelley just, you know, blithely skate over it a bit. They, they say the right phrases, but they don't realise just how deep that struggle goes. Blake does realise just how deep that struggle goes. Thank you. Thank um, you. Sal sorry, uh, Salvo, and a couple of other hands raised. And hello again, it's been a long time since we've spoken. Hello, hello, Jason. It's nice to see you again after you as well. <laughs> so many years. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, inspiring presentation. And I, I noticed that you mentioned 
uh, twice uh, a, a possible uh, comparison between Blake and Spinoza. And yes. both, both the time you, you made the gesture like this. <laughs> and I uh, <laughs> empathize very much with the gesture because it's the same kind of uh, sensation I had in, 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 this, in this comparison. Because on, on the one hand, it seems that they, they both reached to some similar kind of goal. You know? like non-dualism or also this idea of, of, of religion. But at the same time, uh, they, they go to the same point to, to completely different yes. uh, routes. You know? So what, what, what do you think? It, it's, it's a possible that there are different routes for the, to get to the same wisdom to, to it, uh, uh, Blake Richard, I, or- I, I think- I think, I mean, so, so for many, I was working sort of a series of papers, all of them abandoned, it must be said, in which I was attempting to, to find, you know, this, this combination. Um, where I think actually I started to find it really problematic was just that realisation that just how profound matter is to Spinoza. And that there was no way, if I was to remain intellectually honest to what Blake was doing, that uh, could I reconcile this? And I, I think the fundamental for me is that for, for Blake, Blake is probably closer to Kant. I mean, um, Gareth said earlier, you know, sort of that those potential, you know, there, there are significant differences, but for, for, for Kant, the perception of the world around, our perception of the world around us is fundamental to our construction of those, those categories of knowledge. Um, Spinoza, I don't think, has made that connection. I, I think Spinoza kind of leaves asthesis, perception, out of his system. And that's why, ultimately, he's trying to find the root cause of everything. I'm going to be glib now and say that I don't think, in the end, Blake is concerned with the root cause. You know, you find the origin of the world, and there's another Zoa who made another origin, and somebody made Loss, who then made Eurizen, who then made something else. So I think Blake can go for that infinite series of, of retractions to get to the source, where Spinoza wants to locate it in matter. And I noticed that Tim's hands raised, and Tim, thank you. Is it? Is it are we worrying about time? Is that a time or anything? I would just like to to say Philomena has one question. Shall we say that is the final question? Yes. No. Yes. But thank you, Sam. So that's again. You ask, it's, it's like dropping a bombshell, which I can give like thirty seconds in response. It's a great question, and sometimes we must talk about this properly. Thank you, uh, Philomena. Thank you very much, Jason. Hugely stimulating your talk. Thank um, you. I I wanted to start with. A quick comment on your well-found tirade on prophecies. I rather think, and this is not a question, this is just a comment which we can talk about later, but I rather think that Blake might have approved enormously of the life of Brian in that context. Yes. That, that's, and, now, and now here is my more serious question. I was more, I was deeply struck by what I take to be a very profound resemblance between what you were describing about Blake and his view of the divine with the views of the um, Bengali philosopher Sri Aurobindo. Yes. And his theory of um, human transformation, he sees humanity as a completely spiritual um, in, in his, in, as a divine, as a mental construct, and what he interprets as his life divine, and that's also the name of his seminal work, is yeah. that you, you can transform yourself into a supermental being. I wonder whether you have any comments on that. I'm not a Blake scholar. With regard to Blake, am I making a link that's not really there? Um the, the, the link obviously can't work there in terms of we've been talking about link potential links with Spinoza or Kant, etc. It, it can't exist, obviously, in that, those kind of categories. Um, it would exist more the kind of link that I made earlier with the, the, the reference to Soetsu Yanagi. So, so Soetsu Yanagi, um, a Buddhist in tw early 20th century Japan, read Blake and went, this is Zen. You know, this I'm reading a Zen philosopher. I, so I think it would be more that, that you know, that, that there would be people up 
I was misled, actually. I, I, I've got a huge amount of time for Northrop Fry, you know, one of the one of the greatest Blake scholars ever. But he misled me for many years by being very adamant that Blake was not a mystic. And the reason for that is that Northrop Fry had a, gave a very narrow definition of mysticism. I think that Blake thoroughly fits into a whole range. If, if you treat the term very broadly, there's a whole range of mystical writers, you know, in, in, in Christian trad traditions. I mean, Jakob Burma is somebody that Blake appeals to um, explicitly. Um, also then, he, he, he himself, I don't know how deep his knowledge of Hinduism was, but he knew enough about it to recognise that there was some, that he could connect to it in some way. He could see that there were links to what he was doing. If, if he'd known in more detail the kind of the um, the references to Brahman and Atman and things like that. I think Blake would have recognised those intrinsically. I've never been able to find the killer evidence that he really did. Um, a lot of th there was material that was starting to emerge in the late 18th century of, of proper beginnings of proper philosophical investigations into Hinduism, but they weren't detailed enough at the time for Blake to do. So, so mine would be my, my answer to your question would be. The links that people will find with Blake across a whole range of philosophies, I don't like the phrase, but it's one that Aldous Huxley used when he spoke of a perennial philosophy, and he himself was massively influenced by Blake. Yeah. But Blake said all religions are one. If you accept that religion is a human invention, that it stems from desire, imagination, whatever you want to call it, it stems from this human agency, this energy, this push, then all religions are one. And that's Blake's ultimate kind. Of, it's, it's actually a very rationalist mysticism. I mean, uh, that's why I said Blake is a philosopher of the Enlightenment. Blake is a thinker that come, who comes out of the late 18th century. He can be incredibly hard-headed about some of these ideas. Um, so he traces this process logically. We, we are creatures who invent, and amongst the things we invent are gods. And that seems considering the title Divine Image, seems a good point at which to stop and buy the book. <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> thank you, Jason. Thank you. Very welcome. On behalf of the Blake Society, thank you so much for this evening and for the energy and eternal delight you bring to Blake. Oh, talk, uh, <laughs> talk about Blake is always bliss. <laughs> for everyone in the Society and everyone who's come tonight, we thank you. And thank you. Good night to everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Thank you so much.